Hello everyone. Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dhiman Bhattacharya, Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature, Center for Comparative Literature, Bhasha Bhavan, Vishwabharati. The author of this module is Dr. Shagota Bhattacharya. In this module, the learning modules as defined are what is modernity in Canada? What are the major traits of modernity in Canadian poems? Who are the modern Canadian poets? And in conclusion, what and how is modernity being negotiated in the poetic works of the major poets in Canada? Modern Canadian poetry. Background. In the early 20th century, Pauline Johnson and Robert Service were the most popular poets writing on the tales of the Yukon Gold Rush. The first tentative experiments in the 20th century poetic technique began in 1914 with Arthur Stranger's free verse collection of poems called Open Water. Ephor Scott, a. J.M. Smith, Leon Adel of McGill University ushered in the modernist principle in Canadian poetry in the early 1930s. The Great Depression dampened creative activities. In 1936, New Province, a pioneer anthology, was published by Scott. W. E. Collins's The White Savannas was published in 1936. Around the same time, the Canadian Authors Association CAA, was founded by Pratt and the Canadian Poetry Magazine was also founded when the Second World War broke out. Canadian poetry appeared to be firmly set into two camps, the modern and the traditional. In 1942, Ralph Gustafsson's anthology of Canadian poetry carried English Canadian poets to a large readership under the prestigious imprint of Penguin Books. It paved way for subsequent anthologies such as Smith's The Book of Canadian Poetry 1943. The 1950s saw the establishment of Northrop Fry as a major critic and literary theorist. He influenced J. Macpherson, Ellie Mandel, D. G. Jones, and later Margaret Atwood. The Contact Press appeared in 1952 and published the poems of Margaret Atwood, Al Perdir, Phyllis Webb, Frank Davy, Ellie Mandel, and others. Since the 1990s, Jan Zwicky and Tim Lilburn have been writing poems on philosophy and Canadian culture. The New Oxford Book of Canadian Verse, edited by Margaret Atwood, is the most notable and representative text of modern Canadian poetry. Earl Burney, 1904-1995 Earl Burney was born in Calgary, Alberta. He tried his hand at various jobs before pursuing English literature as the subject. He then studied at the University of British Columbia, Toronto, Berkeley, and London. Burney served in the Canadian Army during the Second World War. In 1946, Burney began teaching at the University of British Columbia, where he founded the first Canadian creative writing program. Earl Burney has been one of the most prolific among the Canadian poets and has written several books of poems, these novels, plays, and also non-fictions. Among the notable books of poems are David and Other Poems, 1942, Now is Time, 1945, Trial of a City and Other Words, 1952. He is one of those rare poets to have written and acted in films. Can Lit can Lit is considered to be the representative poem of Canadian literature. The name of the poem is by itself suggestive enough. Can Lit is the abbreviated form of Canadian literature. The poet in the small poem expresses his anguish at how the entire corpus of Canadian literature is made to fit within a shrunken abbreviated form Can Lit. 
he rules that when eagles fly out they leave shadows no bigger than wrens here the eagles represent english literature which has overshadowed canadian literature bushed earl bernice bushed chronicles the struggles of the early pioneer who decided to settle in canada and make a livelihood out of the land determined to overcome all obstacles he endures tremendous hardship and starts from scratch inspired by the natives of the land he learns to hunt and cook and build shacks on the shores of the land the beauty of nature the canadian mountains would see tell him with awe but at the same time the ruggedness of nature thwarts all his endeavors to progress slowly and steadily he learns to face and overcome all obstacles coming from nature as well as from the indigenous people living side by side the poet refers to valkyries the mythological female figures who declare who shall die in a battle the pioneer compares himself with the primitive man who had once started out on the path of survival and had later been successful in becoming civilized the name bush has a particular significance in the context of canadian literature bush represents wood or uncultivated land it is a symbol of the untamed and uncivilized expanse of land which dominated the nation called canada hence to be bushed is to be thrust into the woods from where the struggle for survival begins in his poem the struggle ends on a note of hope and the canadian bush gives away to cultivation and civilization the idea of modernism in canada needs to be closely aligned with the people who settled here there has always been this tendency to look at the works of the pioneers who settled first in the land and had developed a kind of rapport with the original inhabitants that is the native people various poets have already talked about this idea of canada being an uncultivated land and gradually becoming cultivated the idea of cultivating a particular land cut the idea of cultivating a particular land is closely associated with the development of the literature of that particular land here poetry being one of the major interventions the history of the jews in canada before 1760 there were officially no jew in new france because king louis 16 made canada officially catholic In 1760 General Geoffrey Amherst seized Montreal and several Jews were members of this regiment. By 1850 there were only 450 Jews living in Canada, mostly concentrated in Montreal. With the growth of antisemitism in the early 1900s, Jews began to flee to the United States and Canada in large numbers. They were mostly tradesmen and usually quite prosperous. Canada has a tradition of Jewish poets such as A M Klein, Irving Layton and Elie Mandel all of whom have been prolific and famous. A M Klein 1909 to 1972. Abraham Moses Klein was a poet, journalist, novelist, short story writer and lawyer. He was born in Ukraine and moved to Montreal probably at the age of 3 or 4. a victim of persecution the klein family had fled from ukraine and took refuge in canada klein belonged to very orthodox jewish sect and wrote poems such as elum which speak of the jewish tradition and culture among his notable works are new provinces 1936 hath not a jew 1940 and the second scroll 1951 Portrait of the Poet as Landscape A M Klein's Portrait of the Poet as Landscape has since its publication been at the center of much of Canadian criticism regarding the genre of Canadian poetry In A J M Smith edited Towards a View of Canadian Letters 
one whole chapter has been dedicated to the issue which is central concern of this poem. The chapter is aptly titled Poet. Klein's poem deals with this poet figure who is at a loss as to how to define itself. Like the Canadian landscape, the poet figure is indefinite and definable. The poet is someone who fails to realize what role he actually plays and what role he should play in his society. What he actually realizes is that in reality not only is he playing any role at all, but his absence is not being felt anywhere. It is as if the society does not need any poet and is thriving well enough in the absence of one. Eelum Eelum is a nostalgic poem of a Jewish poet who is aware and proud of his Jewish heritage. He states that he has acquired holy books from his ancestors instead of jewels and treasures. They have not been rich in terms of money but rich in terms of culture and tradition. He fondly remembers the pamphlets and prayers bequeathed to him by his father. To him the sermons, the scorpion, printed on the paper, the picture of virgin floating on the scriptures are more precious than any material comfort. They remind him of his noble lineage and his proud ancestry and protect him as a coat of arms spread around him. Along with the letters, his tears also shine brightly and stain the papers as he goes through them. In his exploration, he suddenly discovers a white hair which had fallen from his father's beard. These treaties protect his lineage and his memory and keep him reminded of his distinct cultural heritage in the multicultural land of Canada. Amy Mandel A. Elias Wolf Mandel 1922-1992 was born in Saskatoon. Canada to Jewish parents who had migrated from Russia. He studied English at the University of Saskatoon and later taught English and creative writing at the University of Alberta, Victoria, Toronto and York. His first publication was Trio in 1954 in which he was the third poet along with Phyllis Webb and Gail Turnbull. Black and Secret Man 1964 was his major work. From the North Saskatchewan. From the North Saskatchewan is a nature poem where the poet describes a boat ride along the river Saskatchewan up to its northernmost banks. It is a journey taken when the wind was high and the night was beautiful. It was that time of the day when the sun had just set and the poet was unable to see in the darkness how far the trees marked the skyline. The clouds in the sky had seemed to the poet like corpses lying in the battlefield after the battle is over. The scenery had made the poet philosophical and had raised the question as to who had sent him here down on the earth. Just as the destination of the shore cannot be seen from this point of the journey, similarly the poet felt that from the point where he stood in his journey of life, the destination could not be seen. He did not know what lay to the north of Saskatchewan, just as he did not know what lay ahead in his life. Houdini The poem is named after Harry Houdini, 1874-1926, the famous American magician. Houdini was famous as an escapologist. It is this identity of the great magician which had appeared to Mandel in this poem. He refers to the famous trick which had made Houdini a huge success internationally. It was trick in which the magician used to lock himself up in an iron chest which was then bound securely with iron chains. Not only were the chains locked up separately, the magician himself was also tied up with ropes and handcuffs inside the chest. Houdini used to come out of the water to the astonishment of the spectators. Similarly, much to the amazement of the general mass, the un underestimated Canadian poet manages to come out of doom in the most unexpected manner. His magical quality shows him to generate surprise in his readers, however much they ignore him. Irving Layton, 1912-2006 Irving Layton was born in a small town in Romania to Jewish parents. The family migrated to Montreal in 1913 when he was just a year old. Layton became interested in politics and social theory since his school days. 
After graduating in agriculture, he took to writing poems. In 1942, he got himself enlisted in the Canadian Army. Since the 1950s, Irving Layton became an internationally acclaimed poem. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1981, but the honor eventually went to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. His first book of poem was published in 1945 called Here and Now. He was a free thinker and some sort of a rebel. Throughout his life, he fought against Puritanism. The Birth of Tragedy Leighton's poem The Birth of Tragedy is another poem on the art of creativity in the likes of Klein and Mandel. The poet expresses his joy and satisfaction as he gives birth to his poem. It gives him happiness and a sense of power. It makes him feel as he is like nature giving birth to trees and pools. He watches the beauty and color of nature and her creations, her sights, sounds and odor. Poetry sustains a passionate meditation within him. Yet he is aware that he is giving birth to a tragedy. When the creation goes out of him, the poet is left alone and devastated. Drained and exhausted, the solitary poet rests himself on a chair and looks out solemnly at the leaves and blossoms outside. He feels that all creations are mortals, that they have a definite time period of survival. Their liveliness and happiness shall one day be taken away by someone from afar. A single gesture from that power shall blow away the candle of life. This thought makes him sad and pensive as he realizes that all births are essentially tragic as they shall one day be transformed into death. This takes away much of the happiness he had felt on his ability to give birth to a poem. It is very interesting to note that the thematic patterns of the poems we have discussed so far talks about a tragic moment in the life of the poet. Tragic why? Because in the birth of tragedy, just like as Mandel had talked about the famous magician Houdini, as if everything comes out of a doom. The poets of Jewish origin reflects the anxiety of being in a society which has tried to doom their generations. And writing poetry in itself is a journey from them as if coming out of that doom and giving birth like a magician. The Fertile Mark The Fertile Mark is a philosophical poem in which the poet insists on the supreme design and force of the creator who has control over nature and human beings. Man tries to dominate nature and his surroundings with all his might but ends up being a loser. Trees, fruits, flowers, insects, everything live in their own cycle of life over which man has no control. The poet feels that there are only two ways of dominating the reality. One is love and the other imagination. It is only by loving another soul that man can forget himself and his ego. Al Purdy, 1918-2000 Alfred Wellington Purdy was born in Ontario and served in the Royal Canadian Air Force during the Second World War. Later, he became a teacher and started writing from the 1960s. His celebrated works include The Enchanted Echo, 1944, and Sex and Death, 1974. Poem Alperdi's poem is an allegorical poem which shows two sets of relationships between a lover and his beloved and between a creator and his creation. On the surface level, it is a lover addressing his beloved and expressing his concerns on her illness. He lifts her up, takes her to bed and sits beside her in a dark room holding her hands. It is a gesture signifying that he shall not leave her when she is suffering. The lover knows that the illness is not serious and that his beloved shall recover after a few hours of sound sleep. The entire setting has a layer of inner meaning in which the lover is the creator and the beloved is the created. Phyllis Webb, born in 1927. Phyllis Webb, born in 1937 in Victoria, British Columbia. In her early life, she served as a radio broadcaster in CBC. She has taught creative writing courses at the universities of British Columbia and Victoria. She is mainly a poet who writes occasional prose. 
Her most famous work, The Vision Tree, won the Governor General's Award in 1982. The Sea is also a Garden, 1962. The Grapevine, 1992, are among her other famous works. To friends who have considered suicide, Phyllis Webb expresses her desire to connect Canadian poetry with the poetic traditions of other countless by linking it by the theme of suicide. Suicide had been a literary tradition in almost all major literatures of the world. Hart Crane, Virginia Woolf, William Ainge, Ernest Hemingway were all victims of self-destruction. In fact, suicide is a tradition which has united the major literary traditions throughout the world. Michel Foucault was a great proponent of suicide. In Webb's poem, the poet considers suicide to be a good idea. So all this while we have seen that like many other thematic structures present within Canadian literature, survival becomes a major strategy. Be it Atwood or be it the poets we are discussing in this particular module, survival becomes a very important strategy. Survival is not only physical survival, but it is definitely survival of ideas. The poet or the poetess actually evokes certain images of death to probably realign their existence with the existence called death. Margaret Atwood, born in 1939. Margaret Leonor Atwood is a poet and novelist who began writing since the age of six. Born in Ottawa, Atwood was a professional poet by the time she became 16. She had taught at various universities including the University of British Columbia, University of Alberta, York University and New York University. Atwood's survival, a thematic guide to Canadian literature, is a standard introduction to Canadian literature in all Canadian studies programs internationally. A prolific writer, Atwood has tried her hand in all genres, inclusive of short stories, novels, children's books and even television scripts. The Edible Woman, 1969, Surfacing, 1972, The Handmaid's Tale, 1985, The Blind Assassin, 2000 are some of her notable works. Notes towards a poem that can never be written is dedicated to Caroline Forsh, Atwood's fellow American poet. This poem can only be understood if read in conjunction with Klein's portrait of the poet as landscape. According to Atwood, there is no poem that a poet can write because whatever he, she writes does not matter to the readers. The poet's persona realizes deep within that no matter what is written, nothing works. This crisis is a specific Canadian crisis where the society is no longer in need of a poet and hence anything and everything can be passed off as poetry. As a conclusion, Atwood says that had the poem been written somewhere else, it would have fetched the desired effect and the desired recognition. Variation on the word sleep. Variation on the word sleep can be thematically linked to Alper this poem where the poet puts his creativity to sleep. In this poem too, Atwood creates the persona of the poet who is watching his creativity lying asleep. The poet says that he too would like to fall asleep, that is, in other words, it would be better if he were to give up creating anymore. Unfortunately or fortunately, it is not possible for the creative soul to stop creating. He laments because he is aware of his lack of significance in the society. He is aware that he is neither noticed nor is he necessary. Still, he cannot give up writing. He has to watch painstakingly as his creation goes off to sleep and can do nothing but hope to revive it sooner or later. His only hope lies in reviving his creativity by acknowledging the fact that he would not receive recognition. It is the only way in which he can continue to write. In that way, he might be unnoticed and unnecessary yet alive. As we have already encountered that the idea of modernity in the Canadian context, especially in Canadian poetry, is highly problematic. Because depending on the racial origin of the particular author or the poet, the idea of modernity is renegotiated. 
the way a person with a Jewish background encounters modernity and another person with another racial origin recognizes or negotiates with modernity has to be different. Modernity as an event, modernity as reflected in the poems is also closely aligned with the idea of survival in Canada. Sustaining oneself and writing poetry in Canada has definitely not been an easy task. This becomes a recurrent motif in the writings of the poets. Suicidal tendency is observed in most of the writings. If not suicide, then the idea of sleep and then again coming back to life as the magicians could do like Houdini. So, the idea of modern poetry as reflected in the writings of the poets we have discovered is closely aligned with the survival strategy in this land called Canada.